so everyone first of all thank you for your time in coming over for this discussion i think uh, this topic was chosen between myself and john in terms of relevance of the topic and in terms of the audience which we will have so while on one hand it relates to the finance professionals who are part of this esteemed group on the other hand we wanted to have a connect you know between various parts of the world where all of us live in so i think the idea naturally came out in terms of exploring the opportunities where all of us could try to work together you know so if you see the topic it's in a way split into two parts one is from a technical perspective of knowing the topic and second and more importantly in terms of discussions which all of us will have on the topic and see how we could collaborate in future so shalot if you could please take to the next step right so this is the first slide which talks about the cost management piece so when we say cost optimization essentially we are talking about cost and how to manage cost before that we need to really understand what are those levers because of which the situation has come at a client's place which is asking us uh, from a professional perspective to you know to to guide and to help in cost optimization so i tried to put various kind of costs into four pillars you know i tried to see whether i should list all the type of costs down should i try to put it in functional sense and then eventually i thought that i should you know put four pillars in terms of the area in which the cost comes in in terms of the efficiency which the cost management will bring in terms of the kind of end to end impact what cost will have which is like supply chain and last and uh, but not the least important is the part in terms of how you could ensure that the model which you have built is sustainable and it scales as we move on so in terms of working capital management we are saying that what it means is to ensure sustainability reduce reliance and exposure to short term funding needs it is also subject to exposure and risks from areas including receivables payables and inventory management so i think all of us would see that when we work with client when we try to look at from the cost aspect a major part relates to either the capex cost which is capital expenditure or the opex which is operational expenditure and through working capital management we are saying that essentially whatever a client and his business is doing on a day to day basis you know for example buying inventory um, selling goods to the customers building up debtors building up creditors having some cash in hand all these elements which are part of the working capital and essentially a major part of the entire uh, you know financial uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know ecosystem what the client so to say has at its place is what we are trying to manage second relates to the operational efficiency if we move on the right hand side to the next pillar what we are saying is that companies often reduce focus on operational and process efficiency top performing companies understand the fact that financial strength is built from driving out operational inefficiency so what we are saying here is essentially when we talk about managing the cost we need to see that ultimately the entire operational part has to be involved and has to be made efficient which is a foundation and backbone of how the cost management comes into effect third part relates to supply chain as i mentioned when we say supply chain we are essentially talking about uh, uh, inventory we are talking about the procurement of the same we are talking about logistics travel uh, the the involvement of intermediaries and agents everyone in the supply chain where we have many pressures in terms of the cost and if we are able to manage cost this will lead to more strategic sourcing consolidation of resources and improved contract and inventory management right 
the last one relates to data process and technology. So as I mentioned, I think the first three related to the core area in which the client is working. And fourth is essentially the pillar, what the client has made on which all these kind of costs and resources and the entire ecosystem is revolving. So when we say data process and technology, ultimately we are saying that how do we manage all these items so that we have a scalable model as we move on. Any, any thoughts, any, any queries here, please? We can uh, take uh, some quick ones uh, before we move on. Sure, uh, we'll move ahead, Shana, please. Thank you. Right, and then what I'm trying to describe, uh, so just, just a quick thing, everyone, I think this is a very short presentation. The idea was to capture and agree on some technicals and then we will move on to the collaboration part. So uh, I'll just come to, to the second part as well. Here I'm trying to capture the ethos, what the client should have while he's trying to optimize and manage the cost. And this is my own way of finding out how those ethos should be built. If you see, there are three words written here, cost, C, O, M, optimization and model. So what is a cost optimization model revolves around the three pillars. One is about the cost, you know, which means that uh, we are talking about only the cost and nothing else, right? Uh, second is optimize. We are not talking about arbitrary reduction, but essentially we are talking about optimizing from a long-term perspective and from a uh, sustainability perspective. Third one is model. It is just a starting of the journey. It's a model which will go through several iterations. And after that, we will come to a situation where we can pass it on to the client saying that <clears throat> we looked at the data, we analyzed the cost, we tried and, and improved the cost from a short term perspective. And we have built a model and uh, we have built a rather an ecosystem which we can hand over to you and you can take it from now on as you scale up and as all of your resources are equipped in terms of how this model has to be implemented. So I, I personally believe that if we are able to implement the cost management from a perspective of focusing only on the cost and not about any other hidden senses in the system, if we focus to optimize rather than doing an arbitrary redu reduction, and if we try to build a model which is scalable, I think we should have a very deep impact at the client place from a cost reduction perspective on a long-term basis. Yep, Vineet. Yeah. Hi, Vinny. Thanks. So it's, um, you know, so I'm listening to what you're saying. Um, and, I, and I think what you're saying is, you know, many companies have looked to uh, to partner with with India, uh, either a, a, you know to, to set up a, a, a ground floor operation um, to to take some of these uh, these high volume processes in house. And I think what you're saying is that you know originally companies um, you know um, looked at this as a, as a pure cost arbitrage and there was let's move the activities quickly and we can get uh, a pretty dramatic uh, cost reduction and, and realization but my what i'm hearing you say is that that that's a bit short-sighted because um what you need to think about is, is optimizing the process and making sure that there's a, a really well-defined process in some cases prior to, to, to moving the activities because uh, that, that process, there, there's, a, there's a, a tremendous untapped potential when you're moving uh, poor or undocumented process, uh, especially if you hope to scale and grow in future years. Uh, is, that, is that the message you're trying to share with us uh, here, here today? Absolutely, Mike. I think uh, when, when I talk about the optimization part and more importantly from a model part, it is absolutely the way you uh, uh, described and thanks for bringing it up. Uh, yes, BPO and offshoring and outsourcing is the perfect example 
where I still believe that companies outsource uh, not really from a long-term vision perspective. They thought about today and maybe uh, let's say near future that this is the cost which I'll incur if I have in-house. This is the cost which I have if I incur out. So, you know, outsource, right? And what they saw is that in next four, five to 10 years time, the costs increase. You know, for example, they outsource to India, the cost of resources increased, the various kind of uh, cost increase because of which the vendor in India increase its cost. And it's built either it's in built in the contract or there were the extended contracts which came into place. Then what company had to do is to look at other locations, let's say either China or Eastern Europe or uh, you know other locations where it could again give him uh, more cost benefit. So ultimately what happened is that, as you rightly said, again, till that time you, we have our internal processes frozen and agreed upon uh, doing anything uh, about cost management will be an arbitrary decision and arbitrary reduction. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of companies have just been so attracted to the, the you know, the immediate cost reduction that's relatively little effort. <laughs> Um, but but you, when you go, I know in my, my most recent role, you'd go and travel and you'd see the, the amount of people and the confusion and the, the uh, redundancy. It, it's, ve it's clearly very inefficient. Um, and so I, I think what we discovered and, and what comp some companies can discover is they can achieve and capture those, those cost, cost reductions quite, quite quickly. But when it comes to... Um, uh, you know, having an organization understand its processes and then be able to, to deliver value to the rest of the organization. It's very, very, very difficult when, when, when process is not clear and uh, uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot of confusion. So I, I would coach you know, companies that, and, that are, and when I'm doing this again um, to, to really not, uh, to not be short-sighted and just think about the, uh, you know, the, the cost or arbitrage uh, because um, it really comes down to the clear documentation and, and actually accepting better, better process, uh, best in class process, uh, yeah. being open to that change prior to, uh, to, to moving the activities. Do you, what would you say about the, the market in, in the marketplace in, in uh, you know, in India, you're in, in Delhi, uh, you know, are, are, what, what type of a model are you seeing um, uh, international companies begin to adopt? Uh, are they all investing uh, individually in their own people uh, and their own facilities locally? Or are they, they partnering with a business that, that perhaps has a much larger, uh, um, you know, a, a demonstrated competence uh, you know, wh where they can bring best in class process and change it immediately? Sure. Mike, if you allow, I think uh, we'll park this question and uh, very soon we will end with this, at least the presentation part and uh, uh, the floor will be open and I'll, I'll seek your uh, queries and thoughts. Go ahead. Mike? Oh, sorry. No, I, I think that's great. Thank you. I'm enjoying this. Okay. So, uh, no, no. So I was saying that if you allow, um, I will park this question and we'll take it up later. Yeah, ab absolutely. I understand. Yeah, please proceed. Charlotte, please. Right. So uh, everyone, um, I think through this slide uh, and in terms of the flow, what we are doing is that we discussed briefly about the cost management and the way we should try to attempt cost management from a long-term impact perspective. Through this uh, discussion and slide, I think what I wanted to show and gradually coming on to the topic what we have is the fact that the kind of ecosystem every professional, for example, at FNG has when they get a cost optimization project or when they have an opportunity to add value to the client, even though that FENG member personally may not be uh, expert in, in the area of cost optimization. So what I'm trying to say is that you have a project owner at one hand who is uh, our professional colleague and FENG member, 
and then when he gets a project ultimately he has various resources to lean upon one is the online repository one is the help of professionals like us uh, and uh, equally important is the data and use case so in terms of all the case studies what he can do and uh, uh, the experience what he can find out by attempting similar cost optimization studies which have happened in the past and in, in between we have client and the cost optimization model what we discuss com so everything revolves around the client in terms of the value which we have to pass and everything revolves around the model what we have built to put an impact into this cost optimization right so this is like a hub and spoke model where on one hand we are trying to integrate everything at one place while on the other hand you will have spokes in terms of the supports and in terms of pillars from their different perspective and this and as i said gradually coming back uh, to the to the topic at hand so shalit if you could move on to the next slide please right so this is a key slide which i wanted to really uh, discuss and gradually I'll open the floor as well so i am saying uh, the fact is that when you try to optimize cost there are many areas which a professional has to look upon and you know pass on the benefit to the client so for example when you go to the client's place and say that hey i i am a finance guy i can help you optimize cost and he will you give you the data about marketing about uh, uh, procurement about uh, uh, overheads about different types you know uh, as a finance professional i may not be expert into supply chain so while i can do a crunching and analysis of the numbers but i may not have technical expertise to delve deeper into that subject matter area so through this slide we are trying to discuss and agree upon that there are various areas uh, combining which will give you a, 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 a you know output from a cost optimization perspective and there is a corresponding area of expertise which different fpng professional brings in even though we might be a finance professional at the end so starting from the first point we are saying that we look at all the cost heads of the clients we try to do a deep dive to compare cost so it's the first stage when we have started the assignment and we are saying that we will get the data we will do a first level crunching we will try to do a first level deep dive and try to see whether the project makes sense what kind of complexity does uh, 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 this uh, uh, project have and uh, what kind of expertise will be required so i am putting it into the category of analytics now as we move on we see that the data and the requirement will relate to the procurement part it will re re relate to the process part it will relate to the crm which is customer relationship management and the marketing part and last but not the least the human resources and the people part of it so you know as we were discussing just a while back all these areas put together is something when the client will get a value unless the client is focused only on one kind of cost optimization uh, project so for example client may call us client may say that hey look i think my overheads are really burning me can you look at that uh, so which means that we took up we take the overheads data now the overheads data could be relating to human resources it could relate to finance it could relate to the operations ultimately we have to bring a technical expertise to better understand why those kind of expenses will incur you know will be incurred sorry and in 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 parallel what i'm trying to say is that even though vinit might get a project it might not be easy for vinit as an individual to work on the project and to deliver success uh, out of it unless there is a entire team of different professionals involved in helping it out so for example we were just discussing with mike mike seems to be a process expert right uh, as soon as i get a cost optimization project i will speak with mike and i will ask uh mike i got this project but it involves development of processes and manuals and gap analysis you know i am a finance guy i can just do number crunching 
will you be able to help me out in putting the processes and our entire system in place and he will say yes but i can't do analytics and i can't do numbers so can you take up so there is a collaboration which is which is coming into place and that is eventually i wanted to lead this discussion to in terms of the opportunities what we as a professionals can have and based on the strengths what we all have as a feng ecosystem we should be more confident and stronger to go back to the client and say that you know we can deliver value to you by taking up a cost optimization project do you see any opportunities where we could have a discussion that's about it uh, from this slide perspective charlotte please thank you so much from a process perspective now moving building up from the last slide what i wanted to say that for example a project owner uh, is the one who will meet the client and all the key stakeholders involved at the client place right at the first level he will try to seek the information from the client try to get an understanding do a first level deep dive and then leave it at that place saying to the client that okay i have listened to you i have got a first level data let me go back and give a uh, you know give a give a thought about it then we are coming to the point 4 of this slide which says explore the areas of help now it relates to the part which we discussed earlier the areas could relate to human resources supply chain procurement data marketing you know all these areas he need to list down in terms of where all he would need help then the fifth point talks about the main element of the discussion today which is networking with the fellow professional colleagues and try to seek the expertise and try to weave a thread to find out how those efficiencies can come out for all the stakeholders in this project <clears throat> sorry and last but not the least after the internal discussion and agreement amongst the fellow professionals the project owner and our esteemed feng professional will go back to the client saying that hey listen i left at point 3 i promised you to revert and uh, you know i did a thinking and i spoke uh, with my colleagues and uh, i think we are ready to take up the project and uh, we let's move on to a detailed discussion stage to do a scoping and finalization of the commercial so yeah just one second so largely i think this is it in terms of the technicals as i said i think in terms of the topic today it is more about discussion on uh, exploring the opportunities as fellow professionals so we we discussed fairly uh, uh, about uh, uh, what kind of cost management practices can be adopted and how we could try to work as professionals uh, i just wanted to briefly touch upon the next topic uh, in terms of uh, if uh, a possibility comes in to present again i think i would like to involve the india part also as mike was just asking and the trends and outlooks there but uh, in terms of today's discussion i would like to have a, a, a views and feedback from the members in terms of the cost optimization projects what they got what they may get what could be the possibilities and concerns around it john what would be your thoughts around it well, well thank you for asking vinay i have two thoughts or two questions Yes, um the first question is um i i like very much the idea that you have a project manager that manages each of these engagements uh, i'm a strong believer in that concept myself what isn't clear to me is whether you appoint project managers who are professionally trained in project management or you take some sort of um fairly well qualified sort of accounting chap off the shelf and anoint him as the project manager but he doesn't have a huge background in classical project management discipline so that's the first question and then the first the second question is to what extent do you 
I think of this as an as is and a to be set of processes. Uh, and obviously, you, you, as you say in your presentation, you start off analyzing the as is process. And it isn't clear to me to what level you decompose that. Do you decompose it one level, two levels? I have seen process decomposition done down to to seven levels, which often exposes a lot of inefficiencies. So can you comment on your decomposition on the as is process and your choice of project manager? Sure, John. Thank you for uh, your thoughts. Both the points are very valuable. I think I'll take on the first point in terms of the roles, what different people play and in terms of the experience. On one hand, it will certainly depend on the project and the complexity around it. What generally happens is that in this kind of project, you may have someone at a relatively junior level when you, you have to do data analytics. You know, So a young chap who is pretty good in Excel, who understands the numbers and how to uh, get an output from the numbers, that's the kind of expertise and skill sets you are looking at. The second level will be when you try to talk and look at the areas like marketing and supply chain. That is where you will need a relatively experienced person who understands the supply chain. Are behaving in the industry. And the third level is uh, surely about the project manager we, who has to be the most competent and expert person in terms of not just understanding the client's industry and project, but more importantly, in terms of taking all the stakeholders together. If you think that answers. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, John, I lost you maybe with some problem. Yes, yes. To, okay. Okay, okay, great, thanks. Second part revolve around the, um, sorry, uh, what was it? I'm sorry. The decomposition of the as is process before you yes. start to move yes. to the to be process, which is going to involve a lot of cost optimization, hopefully. Uh, how, do, how, how, right. how granular is your decomposition of the as is process? Absolutely. I, in the cost optimization projects, John, the uh, decomposition has to go at least three to four levels. And the reason is uh, actually related to the topic what we are discussing when we try to bring all the professionals and experts together. Because uh, as I was taking an example, for example, John might be an expert in the finance and let's say in the overhead space. But when it comes to supply chain, when it comes to procurement, when it comes to inventory, when it comes to marketing, he may require help of other people as well. So when these kind of, yes, thank you, Shalit. Really appreciate that, yeah. So when you try to, for example, talk about, uh, let's say point three, which is about procurement and inventory, unless you bring a supply chain expert and who really does a slice and dice kind of uh, thing with that data and the information, <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, he will not be able to get a satisfactory output and explanation to be given back to the client, right? If it were Vineet as a finance person who does not understand supply chain, if he looks at the data relates to the procurement and inventory for two levels down, he will ask for some additional data from client and then, then he will say, you know what, I looked at your receipts and it seems that your receipts are uh, too much as compared to the volume of production what you have. And uh, that is why the costs are higher. I mean, that's that's really nothing, right? If you give uh, this kind of data to any uh, uh, high school student or a college student, I think he will churn out the data in one or two parts and give it back to you. So decomposition has to be at least three to four levels before we deliver value to the client. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Other questions for Vineet? Sorry, 
Should I take up the question which is coming up on the screen? I don't see a question on the screen, do I? Or oh, in the chat box, actually. Uh -huh. should, uh, should we keep it open? Uh, yeah. People put yeah, in or they, just take up. Comment on the dimensions of the framework, by all means, Vineet. Yeah. So uh, uh, Shivraj has written a point. Hi, Vineet, thanks for your time and presentation. I would like to understand further the dimensions of framework, output model, and best-in-class practices or benchmark utilization in presenting your business case to the clients. Thanks, Shivraj, for uh, uh, putting up this query. Pretty, uh, pretty nice question to for this platform and the kind of audience what we have. I think it, it perfectly relates. Uh, I'll just take up the second part in terms of the best-in-class practices or benchmark utilization. I think I, I really believe that uh, a project which involves different areas and which requires involvement of different professionals, uh, for example, from procurement, from supply chain and all of that, I think there is a combination of both industry and functional expertise which has to be brought in. And that is where these people will be able to bring in their respective practices and benchmarks into picture. If, if, if I were to, you know, for example, present a best in class framework to the client, what I will do is that I will try to research on the industry with the limited time I've got. And I will try to put up some information before the client, which client will surely be able to understand that it is not coming someone uh, who should have a deep expertise into my industry and into the kind of problem I'm trying to save because uh, an organization and a network where you have professionals from different areas uh, and when uh, the kind of this kind of uh, team uh, collaborates and puts up something before the client, the, the functional and the industry value will, will show up. Right. I'll take up the first part in terms of understanding the dimensions of framework and the output model. So from a cost optimization perspective, when we talk about uh, the, the framework and the output model, it is aligned. Uh, first of all, there are various ways of uh, uh, putting up a framework and to have a model in place. One framework revolves around the fact of functional splits. For example, we just discussed in terms of supply chain, in terms of procurement, uh, in terms of uh, you know, inventory, in terms of uh, different kind of overheads. That's one uh, framework on which you will try to put cost, analyze, do a deep dive, put in a best practices, and then see the, the, uh, the comparative which is uh, coming into play and uh, the, the reasons behind it. The second kind of framework would revolve around the type of expenses which have been incurred. Do they relate to the direct expenses, which means that expenses identifiable to the business. For example, a manufacturing company, they will have at least 60%, 65% of expenses related to raw material and labor, right? Uh, the, the second part would revolve around the indirect expenses, which means the, the overheads, which means the salaries of the corporate staff, uh, which means the everything else which you cannot directly allocate to the business. So that will be second kind of framework on which all the costs get stacked, analyzed, deliberated, and then So likewise, we would have different uh, uh, output models uh, and, uh, and frameworks. So a third one, for example, would revolve around the fact that whether you are trying to uh, uh, do, let's say, a cost reduction kind of exercise, whether you are trying to do uh, a cost optimization, which is from a long-term perspective, or whether you are trying to do an exercise related to CapEx or an OPEX. So that framework would revolve around the operational versus strategy aspect of it. Uh, that's my uh, thoughts, uh, Shivraj, based on limited experience. You are certainly uh, pretty experienced and qualified. I would love to have your thoughts also, please. Oh, well, thank you, Vineet. I appreciate it. Uh, one of my main uh, things around positioning that question was there's what you call cost, uh, you know, cost avoidance, you know, 
sure. which could be more direct costs that are taken out, like you pointed out, you know, direct costs versus indirect costs. But it's the intangibles, you know, that really matter for big corporations, you know, in terms of cost savings. That's where the value add comes into play. And that was the reason why I asked you around your framework, because once again, in terms of benchmarking, you did uh, highlight, you know, you have to go via industry or functional. And in my experience, of course, industry is very important. Uh, of course, we are all finance professionals mostly. Uh, but once again, uh, the customization around the functional aspects play a deeper role and provides more value to the client, no matter where they are in the world. And uh, I have done a lot of uh, BPO outsourcing and everything for JP Morgan Chase. And, uh, and I work with uh, clients for IBM's global business services as well. So I've been to parts of India. Uh, I'm based in New York, but I've been to parts of India in Bangalore, uh, Chennai, and Hyderabad. So that, that is the reason why I positioned those three aspects or those three dimensions, trying to understand, you know, how do you capture that and customize it to a client? Because you are gonna present your business case, but once again, the client needs to see the value add because uh, in their uh, normal reasoning and rational analyses, given the analytics that's available, you know, they already have some of the answers. And I was trying to understand the value add. And that's pretty much my thoughts. Thank you so much. I hope you uh, liked the, the, the views which I was able to convey. No, absolutely. Thank you very much for your time and presentation. I do I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Vinny, when, when you I were using you. the word cost in this presentation, yeah. you weren't using cost with a big C. Were you? you were using costs with a small C. I mean, you were including SGNA in your comments, weren't you? Yeah. yeah absolutely. Right. All the costs. Yeah. Hi, okay. I just wanted to uh, connect with Danielson. Yeah. Hi. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, uh, Hi. Would you be uh, able to share of, your thoughts? Yeah. First of all, uh, it's it's a great presentation here, and. Uh, I'm still thinking, elaborating here, everything you presented. I made several notes here. So um, it's uh, also good to be part of this diverse group because uh, uh, I'm trying to connect the thoughts of the team here and, and, and also connect to my background because uh, I see there are a lot of consultants. Uh, I'm much more on the, on the company or corporation side because I'm more a finance executive uh, so in the company that I was working before, I'm in transition now, but I was the head of uh, uh, global financial planning analysis, uh, as well as a regional uh, finance director for uh, South Asia. Um, and we, we always had this constant challenge, right, of cost optimization, uh, as you use here, this generic term. So uh, and the, as the, the head of FPNA, it was really my my role in terms of providing in insight to the to the C level executives and all the regional presidents and challenge them to to improve uh, not only the top line revenues right but at the end uh, the EBITDA or the net operating profit. So uh, I used to work in, in public companies, as you know. I mean, shareholders always want better bottom line year over year or quarter over quarter. Uh, essentially, they want uh, double-digit growth in revenue and sometimes are leveraging the <laughs> net operating profits. So everything in between revenue and profits, you want to squeeze, right? So we. Uh, <laughs> so one point here to add is uh, uh, it's a lot of things I did so far in terms of improving the bottom line of the company is. Uh, is what we used to call uh, do more with less, right? So then uh, you can have several cost initiatives in terms of uh, uh, reallocation of resources, right? Zero-based build budgeting. So you could keep your operational expenses uh, flat, but uh, still doing uh, growing revenues, right, essentially. Uh, 
So that means you are trying to invest in those areas that are, you would get more return on investment. So it's not always just about reducing the cost base, but uh, as you have the numerator and denominator, right? You can also increase the output with the same input, right? So that's the, the different ways to solve the same equation because at the end shareholders want better bottom line, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, all the time we had some uh, pitches or proposal from consultants to bring uh, more value to the company, right? And sometimes it's difficult for us to understand uh, what is exactly the value we're trying to bring to the table or to the company in terms of what do you will do, right? And uh, of course, we started with a very broad scope. Uh, and when you start with a very broad scope, maybe you need to, of course, understand who is the audience that you will speak to, right? You can be maybe talk to the CIO or the CFO, or maybe they are a president or someone more specifically manufacturing supply chain organization. So you, you need to adapt maybe what are the key areas to tackle depends on if you're talking to a supply chain professional or to a CIO, right? More in the IT information services, or maybe more to this, uh, a general manager who is more trying to optimize his business in general. Um, because sometimes uh, what I have seen is that uh, as a consultant, you, you want also to maximize your time with the client, right? So you, you do need to tackle some low hanging fruits, right? And say, look, uh, we can really optimize your SGNA here. And then you have a professionals of, uh, and do very good analytics. And then you tackle reducing travel expenses, optimizing marketing, right? Uh, we did a lot of, uh, one time we had a, a, a huge global initiative to cut uh, sponsorships and those uh, expenses that are sometimes people just, they are there and year over year just keep spending. And then somebody goes there and say, wait a minute, why do we do this, right? Uh, so you, you start challenging some of the baselines of the expenses when you do zero-based budgeting. Uh, so those are the low-hanging fruits, but uh, most of the time you also need to challenge what is the business model, right? As uh, somebody mentioned here, business process optimization, it's always a back and forth, right? In the past, we tried to outsource a lot of our uh, transactions and processes. Uh, yes, yes to reduce our fixed cost and make this a variable cost, right? But oftentimes, and uh, the companies realize, oh, maybe in some areas would be smarter. So then you go to the second wave and think, okay, maybe it would be a wiser to have some internal resources here because I have a better scale, right? Or do a shared services uh, in Panama or shared service in, in, in Thailand, right? Or Malaysia instead of having a global shared services and uh, have a small team in some place that I could be not only more efficient, but also have a better speed, right? Uh, so there are different ways. Of course, some, some of the initiatives can take midterm and long term, right? Uh, and uh, I'm working now, uh, actually discussing with some friends uh, in a pharma company they try to optimize also the the, price, the revenues in terms of, because many consumers and pharmaceutical companies, you also have what we call the gross to net, right? You yes. have the invoice price, but at the end, your net sales is very low because you have a lot of customer programmers. So you can also reduce the cost of your revenue in terms of managing all these rebates, loyalty oh. programs, and that's a, a huge area, right? Uh, of opportunities. Uh, I, I was always uh, year over year having targets to to reduce what we call the gross sales to the net sales because people need to, to, to optimize this model of providing loyalty programs, rebates, and all those uh, uh, sales programs as well. Well, I will stop now, but those are some of the thoughts I had. So yeah, you your thoughts were very valuable, Danielson. I would just say that you are at a position and you have an opportunity to get such kind of project and involve 
the fellow professionals from FENG and uh, help you out in that. I, mm. for one, I, I do quite a lot of pro bono projects, so happy to help you. But other than that, if you see an opportunity where any of the FENG professionals or we as a group could help you out, that will be appreciated. Excellent. Good to know you guys. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Jim? Jim Zidema? Hey, I just thought uh, I should connect with you as well and uh, seek your thoughts uh, about today's discussion and more importantly, the possibilities for us to collaborate as professional. <clears throat> yeah, well, thank you very much for your uh, presentation today. I, I would say I'm just an observer in this conversation. I don't have, uh, I don't have any connection right now with uh, outsourced services uh, in India or anywhere. Um, but uh, I, and I don't have any questions, but I'm enjoying the presentation and conversation today. Thank you. All right, great, great. Thank you so much. Robert? Hi, Robert. It'll be good to have you also in the forum and uh, share your thoughts in terms of if we could work together and how. Thanks much. I think I'm in the same uh, boat as Jim to a degree. I'm an uh, international uh, commercial credit manager, and I'm a consultant right now with Pfizer. And so I'm helping them build scorecards uh, okay. for rating companies. I've done some, so I'm doing financial analysis around the world. And I think one of the benefits that this has been as just an observer is to be able to um, as I build a scorecard and try to understand a business and their efficiencies is to understand the um, one thing I try to do is look at how efficient they are in the use of, uh, of their, uh, their capital. And so one thing I do look at is I do look and see where are companies when it comes to being uh, competitive in their, uh, their structural capital and things like IT. And I've been involved with a few projects with uh, high tech companies trying to uh, work with uh, contractors in, in building either Oracle cloud systems when really that's not the best solution. And uh, so observer more, uh, I appreciate the, the, the technical expertise that I'm listening to. So it's, it's a bit perhaps above me a little bit, but it gives a nice flavor and it, it makes me think about how I can apply uh, your strategies to looking at businesses uh, really around the world and, and those that I do review in India. Okay, thanks. I think a very important point which has come out of your uh, thoughts is the fact that we should take up the work only when where our expertise lies. It is, it is important to tell to the client that, uh, you know, for example, if there is an opportunity and to tell to the client, why don't you hold on? Let me go back and have an internal discussion and, uh, you know, uh, revert to you with a more concrete and more specific answer. Then loop your other colleagues in, loop other experts in, and then go back with a stronger face. Right? Generally, what we do as fellow professionals, we may not have area of expertise into everything what the client requires. On one hand, it does not mean that we reject that opportunity or a project. On the other hand, it might not be good for us to say that, hey, listen, I can reduce your cost in the supply chain. I can reduce your cost towards the IT side. Uh, you know, uh, Ultimately, you mentioned about the point in terms of driving a long-term value proposition to the client. It will happen only if we have a deep expertise into that area. And you know, linking this point up with what John asked in terms of decomposition, unless you go four levels down, you will not be able to bring a point or bring a cost driver, which client knows can really work wonders if handled well. Because otherwise, what we are trying to say to the client is only a consultant speak, which will dilute in six months to 12 months time when the results don't come out. So to drive a long-term value, I think it has to be really by an expert. And uh, even though it means collaborating as professionals. So that's 
So thanks for your thoughts. Yeah. Uh, one thought here I just want to share, I think for the consultants, it will be an interesting area just to have an idea. Uh, but um, uh, for the consultants, uh, one area of opportunity I foresee in the next few months, or I would say at least maybe in the next year, is, is the new normal, right? With COVID-19, which is striking the whole world, I mean, everybody knows that, but uh, what's happening in the multinational organizations, uh, at least uh, the ones that I know, uh, everybody's trying to operate and serve customers, right? But uh, yes. everybody is having a, a, a huge cost increase. Absolutely. Uh, so right now, the priority is really to serve customers, even though you have a cost increase, because everybody's building uh, uh, contingencies and nobody's thinking in, in doing uh, with a more cost or efficient matter, right? So transportation costs are huge, right? In, in the manufacturing sites, everybody is putting a lot of contingencies to avoid uh, the infections, right? And protect and, and for safety of the employees, right? Same thing in people who work in the office, right? So you you really have a more operational cost to operate and bring people to the office nowadays. And by the way, some companies are having more remote jobs and in the near future, they will uh, have the opportunity to reduce their cost with real estate because the offices will shrink with more people working remotely. So I, I really foresee a huge opportunity when you, you get to this new normal and the companies start to breathe, to breathe, right? And understand, okay, how we operate now. And then they will start to optimize all this excess cost they're having uh, with COVID, you know? So that will be an area of opportunity to tackle and reduce costs in the near future. Thank you so much. And if I may request Simha to share his thoughts on the topic today. And uh, uh, if you see any possibility for uh, your fellow professional colleagues to work on the cost optimization. Well, <clears throat> I think the uh, idea is a good idea. Unfortunately, I don't have um, a, uh, my background is corporate treasury. Yeah, so I tend to work with uh, middle market and uh, a little slightly larger companies in terms of optimizing their treasury activities. So uh, lately I've been working with private equity carve outs to create the treasury infrastructure needed to run the operations. So the, um, my interactions with the rest of the group is usually related to banking services and those types of things. Uh, I don't necessarily do a lot of FP&A work anymore. But uh, to the extent that I do come across those activities and there's a larger project, then it makes sense to incorporate the uh, uh, FENG's um, talent pool in order to source those people in order to make sure that we get uh, the best, um, I guess, approach or team to handle a client's uh, requirements. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Thank you for your uh, presentation. I appreciate the, uh, the ideas. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time in, in uh, participating in this discussion today. And uh, last but not the least, if I may go back to Mike from where we started and Mike had uh, a, a good thought uh, when we were uh, starting this discussion, Mike. Uh, would you want to take up that question again and maybe we could deliberate on that? Yeah, if, if time allows, uh, yeah, I was just interested in what minutes, yes. dynamics are you seeing within the, the local marketplace for how, how global companies are structuring uh, their cost optimization uh, functions within, uh, you know, within the Indian market? Right, sure. And uh, um, I, will, I will give my answer quickly for a minute or so, and then I'll request uh, uh, Shivraj if he's around and if he could also chip in with his thoughts because he is also an expert in this area. Uh, Shivraj, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, but I'm, not, I, I'm no expert. <laughs> That's all right. No, no, please, it will be appreciated if you can also pitch in. So Mike, I think from my perspective, the way I see is as follows. I think on one hand, there are, countries and companies who continue pitching about the new work uh, 
uh, in terms of outsourcing to those locations and to those companies and trying to show the value which the client can get. On the other hand, uh, and thanks to Corona and COVID from that perspective, companies have been able to look within, internalize in terms of the benefits, what they could reap by putting these kind of activities in house. And as uh, you're just saying, I think uh, some quick wins in terms of how those things could be set into motion while they try to scale up and while they try to take a long-term decision of how to optimize cost, whether in-house or out, uh, you know, outsource. So on one hand, uh, uh, there is a continuous trend of uh, uh, companies pitching in to get the work while the, the success uh, ratio, I believe would be certainly going down over the years. On the other hand, companies themselves, irrespective of the geographies in which they are, are realizing the fact that they could also do quite a lot of it in-house if they hone the existing expertise and resources or they build one in their immediate ecosystem rather than try to look at the low cost countries or location and that could be relatively a short term vision for me. Shiraj? Yeah, well, I kind of second that where, you know, the main uh, two dimensions are in terms of sustainability and scalability, right? Uh, that's something that uh, most corporations are looking to leverage and yeah. uh, other than arbitration per se, but once again, those costs can increase, uh, you know, based on what uh, basis or framework that you've already set up. Uh, other than that, uh, you know, most corporations that we have kind of like dealt with, let me step, step back and say, you know, the, there is the as a state and there's the to be state, and then there's this big gap. And most corporations that work with some of these Indian firms, they are trying to understand how these firms will enable, you know, this gap fulfillment, if you will. And what are some of the levels? That's why I asked the question around framework and what the model is, because ultimately corporations uh, that try to collaborate with Indian firms, they do want to understand what the desired state would be and what, how these firms, you know, firms like yours, that would enable them to attain to that desired state. Absolutely. And th that, is the, that is the key. Yeah. And yeah. of course, you know, one of the things that we are continuously working in, in your process chart, you had something called professionals. You know, we are still working with the equivalent training that's given to those people out there. You know, are, are they meeting certain standards? Because we work with the APQC, for example, the American Productivity and Quality Council. Yes. And so we try to see, you know, are they kind of like, you know, working towards a particular standard? And if so, what are they? And that's how we try to assess if that's going to be a good partnership. But anyways, that's my thoughts. Mike, uh, I think Shivraj raised a very pertinent point, uh, which relates to the, the discussion in terms of uh, companies realizing the long-term value. So they look at only what is being shown to them in terms of the gap, what they have, and in terms of the desired state at which they should go. And till the time they do an internal study try to benchmark and try to arrive at a target what they want to achieve and then go back to the consulting firms or outsourcing partners. Uh, if I think, uh, if, I, if, if you think Shivraj is correct, only then I think a value creation will come in because the outsourcing companies are going to tell you what they think best. Uh, it may be best for them. It may not be best for the client or the company. Right. Thanks. So uh, that, that's from my side, uh, Charlotte, John, uh, over to you and please help uh, in terms of the next steps. Well, um, I, I'm, I'm I, available I, in terms of my contact details being there on the portal. So please I, uh, let, me help, uh, let me know if I could be of any help at all. First of all, thank you. And I'd love to get a copy of your presentation, Vineet. Um, so if, if you had a few moments and wanted to send me an email with a copy of your presentation, that would be great. Sure. Um, the last piece of the discussion, um, 
as many of you know, my background is IBM for uh, nearly 40 years. Um, the difference between the as in is and the to be referred to in this conversation is the gap. Um, part, part of the engagement hopefully is to uh, design and propose a migration plan to get the client from the as is model, which is not serving him particularly well to the 2B model, which hopefully will achieve all the cost optimization objectives he, he had in mind. So, um, you know, doing the migration plan from the as is to the 2B and making that migration plan credible, I think is part of the sales process in selling these engagements. Um, uh, I am certainly ready uh, and willing at any time to collaborate with you, Benit. I've spent a lot of time in India myself, in Bangalore. I was part of the team that brought IBM back on shore in India in the 1990s in a joint venture with Ratan Tata's uh, Tata Consulting Services Organization. I've done a lot of process engineering. I've done a tremendous amount of IT due diligence work in my career. Audit. Um, so if there's any way I can uh, collaborate with you, uh, you only have to drop me an email or pick up the phone and I'd be happy to do that. Thank you so much. Shannon?